Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to ARU's History Fest. Uh, if you've been with us already, welcome back. Uh, it's nice to see you again. Uh, if this is your first session with us, then we hope you enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, we've got lots more sessions going on throughout the week. So please feel free to sign up to those as well. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much um, because you might all be sick of hearing me talk. Uh, and I'm going to hand straight over to Will, uh, who's going to be leading today's session. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So over to you, Will. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Rob. So, um, hello everybody and welcome to the next exciting session in our History Fest series um, here in history at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, AIU. Um, my name is Dr William Tullett and I'm a lecturer in, in history here at AIU. And today's session is going to be a little bit different from some of the others that we're running for History Fest. Some of the other sessions have covered topics that you might be studying at the moment, sort of giving you further detail and in-depth look into various things, so the stuff on Stalin's Russia or JFK, or I think we've got one on the suffragettes and the use of historical sources. Um, but in this session we'll be looking at some history that might be less familiar to you potentially. Um, but nonetheless, cultural history of the sort we'll be discussing today um, can be found in university history departments uh, across the country. And so this is a kind of little introduction to some of the kind of exciting and different history you might come across if you do history at university, um, including the excellent BA in history here at ARU. So it's kind of complementary to, to the sessions that we're, we're doing elsewhere, but in a, a different way. But I hope you'll see as we go along um, that lots of the periods and themes that we're picking up on are actually very relevant, some of the modules you might be doing. Um, so before we get stuck in, Go do a little bit of housekeeping just to make sure that you can see and hear me. Um, if you can't see or hear me, then uh, type that you can't see or hear me in the chat box and uh, my colleague Rob um, will uh, try and uh, help you out. Um, and I'll quickly introduce in a bit more detail who I am. So um, I'm a lecturer in history. I teach a whole range of modules, um, including many of the first year modules at ARU in history. Um, such as creating the past and um, making of modern Britain. And I'm also an active researcher. I work on sensory history, so how people use their senses in the past, smell, taste, touch, hearing and sight. And I mainly work on the period from the 1660s to the 1850s, so kind of the end of the Stuarts to the kind of Victorian period. Um, and I've got very wide ranging interests beyond the senses. I work on urban history and history of objects and things like that as well. But since I'm interested in the history of the senses and therefore the body, I thought I'd do a session uh, on the history of the body. Um, so that's what we're going to be chatting about today. Um, and I've put my email address um, here and it will be on one of the slides at the end. Um, if you have any questions um, that you think of after the end of this session um, about what we've covered or about uh, more generally um, about uh, uh, studying history at university or at AIU, um, then please do pop me an email. and I'm very happy to help. So the other one bit of housekeeping to do before we start um, is we've got this session from, from two till three. I'll be giving a talk and then there'll be a bit of time for questions towards the end. Um, but we'll also be using a tool called Poll Everywhere and Rob will now hopefully post a link to that um, in the chat below. Um, and at various points, I'll ask you to go to that link and there should be a question that pops up. Um, and you can anonymously answer that question and put in some responses and they'll pop up on my slides. So hopefully that will work. Um, we'll see. Sometimes um, the tech can be a bit challenging, but um, hopefully we'll get, we'll get that to work. It can be quite neat when it succeeds. Um, so with that taken care of, um, let's turn to the small matter of the history of the body uh, and the history of beards. And in this session, we're going to be thinking about beards from a whole number of different angles from the 16th century to the 20th century. Um, and from today's session, I'd really like you to go away with a kind of a better understanding of what the history of the body is and why it's become important and why it might be useful to study. Um, I want you to have some understanding of how attitudes to beards have changed and why they've changed over the last 500 or so years. Um, beards have come and gone over time and they've come and gone for some quite different reasons. And we're going to explore some of those. And, and finally, I'd like you to go away with a better understanding of the way in which the body, uh, and in this case, facial hair, has been used to mark difference, to stereotype people, to distinguish those who belong from those who do not, because that's one of the most important aspects of the history of the body. And in the next hour, we're going to see how the beard has often been used to kind of distinguish between civilization and barbarity, between white and black, between man and woman, and different levels of social status. <clears throat> 
So firstly, the history of the body very briefly to introduce the wider field. So up until the 1980s and the 1990s, historians hadn't been that interested in the body, right? Um, but from the 1980s onwards, a number of historians began to write about the body and its histories from a really wide variety of perspectives. And before that point, where historians have been interested in the body, they've mainly been interested in it from the perspective of the history of medicine. So they've been interested in how the body had been understood in the past by medical practitioners. But evidently, there is a hell of a lot more to the history of the body, right? There's a lot more about the body than how medical practitioners see it. So we've got our first poll everywhere moment, which I'm hoping will work. Um, I'd like you to think, what role does the body or do our bodies in general play in society and culture today? Um, and when you think about the body, what comes to mind? So just if you can access the site and then try and type in some answers, um, that would be great. And they should pop up on the slide. Um, so um, what comes to mind when you think about the body? Um, everybody. Um, we'll see if anything appears. If nothing appears, we'll move on very swiftly. Um, hopefully it will work. I'm just going to log into it now as well, Will, to, to give it a go. So Thanks. Maybe. If it doesn't work, we'll just kind of leave it and move on. But it's nice to create a sense of interaction with people during these talks. Um, otherwise people are going to begin to switch off. Um, but maybe that it's simply not working. Someone, and actually do feel free to post in the chat if you like, if you're finding it um, difficult to post um, in, uh, on the website. So somebody's posted gender differences, absolutely. So gender differences are a really important part of how we understand the body today. And they're kind of a, a thing of increasing controversy at the moment because we have an increase, increasingly vigorous debate between um, trans rights activists and, uh, and um, uh, certain branches of feminism um, over what constitutes womanhood and whether womanhood and the identity of, of womanhood is rooted in the body or whether it's beyond um, the body. So gender is a really, really good example of that. Um, perhaps people have struggled to access the links, in which case we will move onwards, I think, perhaps. Um, Sport. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> as soon as I say that, another one comes up. Fantastic. Absolutely. Sport. So a kind of physical activity that the body is involved in day to day. Um, very, very important. And there's a whole kind of vibrant history of sport, um, looking at the way in which people have thought about sport and kind of exercise more generally um, in the past. And we'll, we might actually mention some of that um, a bit later in this talk. Um, so we'll, we'll move on now because we've... Um, Every time I say that, another one pops up. It's like someone's trolling me. Um, absolutely, race. Um, oh, brilliant. Excellent. Loads more coming up suddenly. Race, absolutely. So um, race, um, racial difference being rooted in the body is something that's um, a product of history, right? It's a historical construct, construct. The idea that race is about the body is something that was developed in the 18th and 19th centuries and somehow still has relevance today. Um, it's not a fixed thing, it's, some, it's, some, it's a category that people have created. Um, and we'll be talking about that later on um, in uh, the session. Um, so I wanted to give you uh, one example from the history of the body, a kind of classic example, um, which is um, uh, Thomas Lecoeur's work um, on um, sex and um, the body. Um, so uh, historians in the 1980s and 1990s were interested in how people thought or felt very differently about bodies in the past. And they turned to a whole range of sources from diaries and letters to anatomical drawings and portraiture to newspapers, magazines and novels. Um, and they became interested in what implications the understandings of the body that they found in these sources had for society and culture more broadly. And Lecoeur's work is a classic example of this. So um, Thomas Lecoeur argued that in the early modern period from 1500 to 1800, um, a very different understanding of the body and its relationship to sex could be found. In this period, people thought, um, didn't, didn't think that there were different male and female bodies that were completely different. Um, instead, they thought there was one type of body and that the female was a worse version of the same body, right? Um, so they thought that the vagina was simply an inverted penis, an, uh, an underdone version of the male genitalia. Um, 
they thought that the, the uterus was an, uh, a scrotum that had been pushed inside. Um, they thought the ovaries were female testicles. Um, so this way of thinking about the body had some really interesting implications um, because, for example, it was, it was some people believed that if women got hot enough, then their vagina would pop out and it would become a penis. Um, that's obviously not the understanding we have today necessarily. Um, but this model, this kind of model of gender difference didn't last forever. And in the late 18th century um, and the 19th century, this one sex view of the body in which ma male and female was on a kind of continuum was replaced by a two sex view of the body or so Lecoeur argues. So physicians came to argue uh, that women and men were completely ph physiologically distinct, right? Not only were male and female genitalia different, the whole female body was completely different from the male one and the two were in complete opposition. Um, they were distinctive, they were separate and they were unequal. So why did this change occur? Well, the late 18th and 19th centuries saw many calls for extending the vote and for universal human rights that had begun during the 18th century, during what historians tend to refer to as the Enlightenment. And for many men, this seemed to be a dangerous move towards greater equality for men and women. Um, and so they needed a new way of excluding women from public uh, political participation. Um, and the idea of separate and distinctive bodies offered a handy solution. So women were described not just as having different genitalia, for example, but having smaller brains. And it was therefore argued they were incapable of taking part in the public sphere of politics and debate. So I wanted to start from this example because it illustrates two of the key elements of the history of the body, right? So number one, the understanding of the body, uh, its biology, its physiology has changed over time and our cultural expectations inform how we see and how we understand and even how we experience our bodies. And those cultural expectations in this case were very different between 1500 and 1800 um, to how they were after 1800. Uh, and secondly, this has important social causes and effects. So the idea of distinctive, different, separate bodies for men and women was used as a reason to exclude women from many areas of life and to continue to see them as secondary citizens. Um, so now we've got some understanding of um, the importance of the body to history and some sense of what histories of the body can reveal, we can turn to the histories of beards and moustaches and facial hair. So um, we've got no, another poll everywhere. Um, so I'd like you to tell me what beards mean to you, okay? Um, what do you associate them with, right? Um, so you can either post answers or once other answers start to appear, you can kind of uprate other people's answers if they've already said something that you uh, were gonna say anyway. Um, so what do beards mean to you? Um, Rob, you might like to take part in this as a, as a bearded man. Um, been waiting for this one. <laughs> if there's one that just says pure class, then I'll, I'll know it was you. Okay, good. So we associate them overwhelmingly with men, but also, as someone else has suggested, we associate them with adult men. So you grow a beard once you become an adult, right? And, and when you're a teenager in your early teens, you have a kind of a little bit of fluff, but it's not a full beard. Um, absolutely, beards could be used as something to hide. So we often use the term beard um, to refer to something that somebody is using to hide, perhaps, for example, their sexuality. Um, and historically, that's the case as well. So people have used beards to kind of hide both emotions, as we'll go on to see, um, but also to hide, th hide things like physical scarring, for example. Um, good. OK, I'll just give you a couple more seconds to see if any others crop up. I'm interested that nobody has put fashion um love or hate yes brilliant i think one of the funniest things about lockdown is that lots and lots of wives and uh, have been complaining about their husbands growing mustaches and beards because they don't see the point of shaving um and some people love their their um, husband's new facial hair and some of them absolutely hate it excellent okay so we'll move on so two initial observations to make about the history of facial hair um one it's constantly moving in and out of fashion um 
the recent resurgence of beards and stubble and moustaches among many men um, after a period when they were largely unfashionable is not unusual, but quite a common historical pattern. Um, and secondly, facial hair has regularly been used to mark out differences between those who do and don't belong, right? Different styles have been used to distinguish between different cultures, and in doing so, they've had different positive and negative attributes attached to them. So already we can see that from some of your responses, because we talked about, you know, being manly, being associated um, with having a beard or moustache, being a kind of adult male, you know, reaching adulthood as being a kind of a positive thing. Um, so we can see the, this, this kind of positive negative distinction emerging even from the kind of very beginning of the history of the beard, if you like. Um, so we can go back to the ancient and medieval period and even in ancient facial, uh, ancient societies, facial hair had a very serious um, had a series of much broader meanings. So the Latin word for beard, uh, barber, um, provides the root of the word barbarian. So the Romans referred to those on the edges of their empire as barbarians, those with beards, or um, those that have beards. And so the beard came to be associated with those who were yet to be civilized, who were, who were kind of the savages on the edges of the more clean-shaven Roman, Roman Empire. But this actually changes with the rise of Emperor Hadrian um, around 117 CE, who really liked a good beard. And that was for two reasons, um, because he was a fan of Greek culture and the Greeks had been very big on their beards, um, but also secondly, because he had facial scarring and he wanted to hide it. So as somebody already pointed out, people using um, beards to hide things. Um, in the medieval period, that relationship between kind of the civilized, clean shaven and the savage who were bearded between conquerors and barbarians was still expressed through um, the medium of facial hair. And we can see this in the Bayer Tapestry, for example, which is the, the Norman visual account of their conquest of England in the 11th century. And here the civilized Norman invaders are represented without beards, whilst the conquered Englishmen have beards and moustaches. Um, here the Normans evoked the historical relationship then between the beardless Romans and the facial fuzz of those um, that they conquered. And that use of beards to distinguish between societies and cultures continues into the 16th and 17th centuries um, and these centuries also see the beard begin to regain its fashionable status right so in portraits from the mid 16th to the mid 17th century the kind of Tudor and Stuart periods virtually all the men have beards and medical texts poetry and guides to male manners all elaborate at great length on the kind of masculine virtues of the beard which of course came in many shapes, and, and this is a quote from the 17th century poet John Taylor talking about the variety of styles of beards that he could see around him in the 17th century. So some like a spade, some like a fork, some square, some round, some mowed like stubble, some stark bare, some sharp stiletto fashion dagger-like that may with whispering a man's eyes out pike. So dangerous beards. Um, but what united all these different styles of beards was that they were all considered manly. So Thomas Hall told his readers in 1654, a decent growth of the beard is a sign of manhood, given by God to distinguish the male from female sex. And the beard in the 17th century was increasingly linked to particular attributes that distinguished men from women, right? So like beards, men were rough whilst women were smooth and therefore tender, at least according to 17th century thinkers. Um, the beard denoted a kind of male vigour, um, and it also signified the peculiar properties of, of the body that made men manly, right? So in the humoral medicine of the 16th and 17th centuries, men are whole, held to be hot and dry in constitution, um, while women's bodies are supposed to be cold and moist. And medical writers reason that the beard was held to be a product of the excessive heat created by men as they produced semen in their testicles. So the bigger your beard, the more sperm you're producing, basically, in the 17th century mind. So the beard it becomes a kind of indication of male virility and of male kind of generative power. Uh, and this led one author, John Bulwer, in fact, to argue that men who shaved aim at nothing less than to become less man. So this period, the 16th and 17th centuries, also saw the rise of new Atlantic empires. And this is where we can come back to that kind of civilized savage distinction in a way that's mapped onto facial hair. The Spanish, the Portuguese, the English, the French, and the Dutch all colonized new areas of the globe. 
in this period, um, subjecting native peoples to European diseases and regimes of hard labour and campaigns to dispossess them of their land and so on and so forth. Um, and a distinguishing feature that supposedly divided the Spanish and the Portuguese, the kind of earliest um, to go to the uh, um, um, Americas from Europe, um, from the Native American peoples they encountered was facial hair. Um, Native American peoples had much thinner facial hair and they tended to pluck out and remove it. Um, by contrast, the Spanish and the Portuguese had very long beards, partly because of current fashions, but also partly because they'd all been aboard ships for an extended amount of time, um, often with very inadequate shaving supplies. And the Spanish writer um, Bar uh, Bartolomé de la Casas, who was very critical of the abuses instituted against Native peoples in the colonies, described how the Native Americans were fascinated by the beards of colonists. So he said, they ran their hands over the Spaniards' beards, marvelling at them because they had none. And La Casas goes on to argue that Native peoples were overawed by the sheer manliness um, of uh, uh, the beards um, of uh, Spaniards and, and the Portuguese. Um, but where we have records in travel writings of how native peoples in the Americas actually responded to beards, they frequently tell a very different story. Um, so in Canada, uh, where the French were busy building a commercial empire based on the trade in furs, um, one 17th century um, Native American exclaimed, oh, the bearded man, oh, how ugly he is. So the Europeans like to think that the natives were overawed by their um, by their by by European beards, um, but actually indigenous peoples had a very different perspective on European beards that they thought were very ugly. Um, now, one thing that colonization and empire did was to extend the knowledge of places and peoples that travelled between um, different cultures. Um, in the 17th century, English writers are increasingly aware of the diversity of facial hair across the globe, right? And this forms one part of a broader interest in the bodily practices of other cultures. So John Bulwer, who's a physician and natural philosopher, which is the kind of, I suppose, in some ways, the closest thing to what we would now call a scientist, um, wrote a whole work on the alterations to the body practiced by different cultures, um, both in the past and around the globe. And Bulwer's point in this book, and this is a set of illustrations from the chapter on beards, um, was to argue that often people across the world meddle with their bodies in ways that are contrary to nature's intention. So in his chapter on beards, Bulwer criticised cultures that shaved or plucked or trimmed part of their beards. So the Tartars and the ancient Britons, for example, are decried as barbarians for depriving the face of its natural ornament. But Bulwer's criticism of clean-shaven faces actually has a deeper political resonance. Um, Bulwer publishes his work in 1650, which is the year after Charles I is executed, when the monarchy had fallen and been replaced by a commonwealth led by the rump parliament after the civil wars. And Bulwer was a royalist who had supported the late king and now was supporting the return of the monarchy. So the royalist cavaliers were known, um, much like Charles I, for their fashionable beards and moustaches, whilst the parliamentarian roundheads had criticised aristocratic long hair and were associated with a clean shaven face. And we've got Cromwell and Charles I here on the slide with very different um, visions of what facial hair should be like. So Bulwer was on the side of the beard lovers, um, but in criticising shaving as unnatural and contrary to the hairy intentions of nature, he was also making a bigger point about the unnatural and the perverse quality of republican government without a monarch. So like the killing of kings, shaving was unnatural and contrary to both nature and God. But despite the restoration of the monarchy um, to the throne in England in 1660, by the end of the 17th century, the beard has very much lost its fashionable place and shaving is on the rise again. So in the late 17th and 18th centuries, we see a kind of new form of masculinity emerge, and it's inspired actually by the work of people like Isaac Newton um, and John Locke, the philosopher. Um, and the idea was that to be manly was now about reason and refinement and restraint and the control of nature. So effectively, hair was turned upside down. Beards were removed um, from the depths of the face, whilst up on top, wigs become increasingly popular and become larger and more elaborate as the 18th century goes on. Um, so the Enlightenment is very much an era of big hair and smooth faces, um, largely inspired actually 
by the late 17th century trends in the French court. Um, and the 18th century is also kind of a moment of consumer getting and spending, right? It's the kind of birth of um, shopping, actually, as we know it today. Um, and newspapers emerge as a really successful way of advertising products and tradesmen print these elaborate trade cards that advertise their, their wares to people. And shaving equipment, um, so blades, shaving soap, brushes, are among the most frequently advertised of those products. Um, and these adverts trumpet the use of a new raw material, cast steel, which is kind of being used uh, popularly for the first time in the 18th century. Um, and so the adverts talk about the use of cast steel and the fact that this makes their razors kind of technologically ingenious. Um, they're sort of advertised as gadgets from, made from state-of-the-art materials. And this kind of makes them seem more manly, I suppose, in the eye of consumers. And we can see that today even in the way that companies like Gillette, for example, advertise their shaving products um, to uh, people. Um, so the polished steel of a well-made razor indicated the, the kind of the refinement and the progress of modern enlightened man. A smooth face indicated that a man was fashionable and open and polite and well-mannered. Um, and the association of clean shaven faces with progress and enlightenment was a lesson that Peter the Great, um, the Tsar of Russia from 1682 to 1725, really took to heart. So Russia had historically been, um, and indeed still is, um, in a quite odd position. It's kind of half in Europe and half in Asia. And Peter really wants to cement Russia's place as an enlightened European country. And one part of his strategy is to build the new city of St. Petersburg on the River Neva, um, which is kind of closer to the West. Um, but Peter also wants to do more than with this. And he needed a way of kind of disciplining and Europeanizing the people over which he ruled. And this is really interesting because the ability of the state to control the bodies of people um, uh, has a long and kind of controversial history. And it continues today, for example, with the debate over abortion rights, for example, in the US and elsewhere, a debate that centers on how far women should control their own bodies and how far the state should be able to take that control away. But Peter felt that the best way of Europeanizing his subjects was to take away their beards, to make a kind of direct statement on their bodies about their Europeanness. Um, and beards have been very important in Russian history as a kind of traditional marker of religious faith and male honor. Uh, and according to the Orthodox Church in Russia, beard wearing was a sign of obedience to God. It confirmed um, God's design for men. And by shaving off people's beards, men were suggesting that they could make their bodies look better than God had designed or intended. So again, kind of shaving a beard is seen as a sort of sacrilegious act. But Peter wants to lessen the power of the Orthodox Church and beards, at least to Peter the Great, appear to be a symbol of the old superstitious traditionalism um, uh, uh, that the church embodied. So in 1705, Peter introduces a beard tax and anybody who wishes to keep their beard has to pay a fine, which varies in size from 30 to over 100 rubles. Um, and for those who pay the tax, um, they're given a medal. Uh, which you can see a, a, a version of on the screen here, emblazoned with a picture of a beard uh, known as a znak. Um, uh, and, and, and this tax was very successful because it didn't actually collect very much money. People chose to, to shave off their beards rather than damage their finances. So in the end, the tax was a kind of useful nudge from Peter to get, get his populace to do what they want. And in fact, the Orthodox churchmen who chose to keep their beards um, become increasingly isolated and their facial hair becomes a very visible mark of the difference between them and everybody else in Peter's new enlightened Russia. Um, and such was the trend, once we get into the 18th century, um, away from beards, um, that by the end of the 18th century, stubble and beards are kind of linked to political radicalism. So Charles James Fox, who's a prominent Whig politician in the late 18th century, who's very supportive of the French Revolution, um, is often represented with a face full of stubble uh, in satirical prints. And Charles James Fox's main patron um, is uh, Georgiana, the Duchess of Devonshire, about which there is an excellent um, uh, film, in fact, that, was, that came out a few years ago. Um, and Georgiana's campaigning on behalf of Fox to become an MP was seen as a step too far for a woman. Right. So lots of critics suggested that she should have kept to her homely duties rather than get involved with the rough and tumble of politics. And so satirical prints like this 
um, portrayed Charles James Fox giving the Duchess a shave. Um, so by getting involved in politics, the Duchess had kind of overstepped the boundaries of acceptable femininity, much like the idea of a woman with a beard, kind of a woman being unnaturally manly. So we've kind of talked about how in the 18th century, um, to bring a country up to civilized standards in terms of kind of what the European Enlightenment thought was civilized, meant shaving off beards and putting on a smooth face. To possess facial hair was potentially to be marked as a radical, a kind of artistic hermit or a work shy layabout. Um, and yet the ability to grow a beard was still seen as something that was quite European. The point was, was that Europeans could grow beards, but they chose for polite and fashionable purposes to shave them off. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, natural historians and physiologists begin to develop um, the ideas that would later coalesce as the concept of biological race in the 19th century. Um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, Europeans had thought that the differences that they perceived between their bodies and the bodies of other people in America and Africa were due to things like climate and diet and other kind of changeable factors. Um, Native Americans, for example, were held to be darker in skin colour because they were quite literally burnt by the sun until they appeared darker. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, natural historians um, and physiologists began to take a kind of a different approach. Um, they begin to argue that things like skin colour change depending on not on, on, on climate and other factors, um, but instead were innate biological differences that were always there no matter what the climate or diet or environment was like. And so they began to use a whole series of different bodily properties like skin colour and facial features and head size to argue that racial difference was biological and unchangeable. And one of the properties that these writers turned to was the beard. So writers such as the scientific racist Charles White argued that women and Native Americans and black men lacked the ability to produce the majestic beard that European men could grow if they had wanted to. Uh, and beards became one aspect of bodily difference found therefore in the arsenal of racial thinkers across the 19th century. And this diagram on the slide is from Charles Hamilton Smith's 1852 Natural History of the Human Species. And it illustrates the way in which beards were used in the 19th century to distinguish the different peoples of the world from each other. So West, North, East and South are mapped onto different peoples or races from the Caucasian to the Mongolic to the Ethiopic associated with different beard types. So by the late 18th and early 19th century, we have a situation where the ability to grow a beard was the sign of being European, but refusing to grow one and shaving it off was the sign of a civilised European, um, and in which um, facial hair became one of a number of categories of difference that were mobilised by racists to try and claim that some people were different types of race were innately biologically different. Uh, so more generally, once we get into the 1830s and 1840s, um, beards are still kind of associated with radicals and with bohemians. In Victor Hugo's famous novel set in Paris in 1832, Les Miserables, um, a conservative gentleman complained, the 19th century is poison. The first little squirt that comes along grows his little goatee, thinks he's a genuine rogue and leaves his old relatives in the lurch. That's Republican, that's romantic. What the hell is romantic about that? So for the young men of France in the 1820s and 1830s, the beard and the moustache became a symbol of resistance and reaction against an older middle class generation. And indeed, the men who formed part of the July Revolution in 1830 in France, which succeeded in overthrowing the old French king Charles X in favour of Louis Philippe, were bearded and moustachioed fellows. Um, in Eugène Delacroix's famous painting, Liberty Leading the People, which you may have seen before, um, this represents the street battles of, of July 1830, and we see two bearded men to the left of Liberty, one with his open shirt and short sword, um, represents the, the working Frenchman, and the other, dressed in a sober black coat and a top hat, carrying a musket, represents a combination of kind of bourgeois respectability, middle class respectability, with the new romantic spirit associated with the young bearded Frenchman. Um, so, the increasing range of facial hair on show among young men was to mark actually eventually the regrowth of the beard and its slow return to fashion by the 1850s. 
the Victorian period gradually uh, sees the beard undergo a resurgence and there was a, a renaissance of facial hair um, uh, that sprang up over the chins and lips of British men um, by the 1850s. So what had caused this, this shift in attitude? Well, firstly, especially in Britain, men were rediscovering a kind of chivalric medieval past, right? So the 19th century sees an increased interest in the medieval and in the Gothic. So architects and artists are inspired by medieval architecture, um, a prime example being the work of uh, Augustus Pugin, who designed the rebuilt Houses of Parliament that still stand today. Um, and people were also inspired by medieval beards. So the manly military properties of medieval knights were put on display at pageants where people dressed up as medieval people, um, in plays, in novels, in paintings and prints that adorned Victorian houses. Um, in 1839, for example, Lord Eglinton, who's a Scottish aristocrat, um, holds a, a medieval tournament um, in which people dressed up and men grew their beards to imitate medieval grooming habits. And the images of this tournament were really popular and they actually find their way all across um, the country. But it's not just a fascination with the medieval past that helps resuscitate the beard in the 1850s. There's also an increased association between military manliness and facial hair. And that's partly because of the rise of the cavalry um, moustache. So from 1805, elite cavalry units in Britain began to sport these long black moustaches that had originated in uh, Hungarian cavalry units in the 17th century. And this style spread across Europe in the Napoleonic Wars and appears in lots of portraits and battle paintings from the Napoleonic period. Um, so you can see an image here of an officer from the Imperial Horse Guards uh, charging by um, Theodore Jericho from, from 1812. By 1850, this fashion for moustaches had spread among all of the units of the British Army. Um, and by 1850, in fact, um, it's common to virtually all members of the officer class. And the military moustache has a number of purposes. Um, it's supposed to strike fear into the hearts of enemies, which might sound slightly ludicrous today, but the impressive moustache kind of forms part of the shining, speedy shock of a cavalry charge. Um, moustaches also help men to appear older and therefore more authoritative, so hence they're used by the officer class increasingly. Um, and indeed, the moustache is, is judged so essential that some cavalrymen um, who are unable to grow whiskers successfully um, ask for fake facial hair to be made for them to wear so that they can maintain this kind of aspect of manly authority. So by the 1860s, the military moustache has become so important that in fact it's made a positive requirement that all officers in the British Army should grow a moustache to demonstrate their authority. Um, and that would continue to be a central element of military manhood all the way into the early 20th century. And we can see it in kind of classic posters of men like Lord Kitchener. So this is a First World War recruiting poster on the slide, who has a kind of bountiful growth of hair on the top of his upper lip. Um, and so this kind of constant use of the, the military man with his moustache reinforces the connection between military masculinity and military duty um, and facial hair. Um, but by the 1850s, um, there's also a kind of gradual rehabilitation of civilian facial hair as well. Um, beards begin to crop up across the Victorian period, um, appearing on the chins of men across society. Uh, in 1848, there's a series of revolutions that take place across Europe, um, led, as we've already suggested, by kind of bearded radicals whose beards mark them out as rebels against middle class respectability. But all of these revolutions failed. And so, with the revolts and protest movements quashed, the beard is kind of allowed to become a more respectable, dignified feature. So as one magazine put it in 1852, already the martial moustache, the haughty imperial, and the daily expanding whiskers like accredited heralds proclaim the approaching advent of the monarch beard. The centuries old banishment are drawing to their destined, destined clothes and the hour and the manner at hand to re-establish re his ancient reign. Um, so in the 1850s, we start to see essays in defense of beards that gets printed, that get printed in newspapers and magazines and periodicals and that encourage the restoration of the beard. And one author named T.S. Gowen even writes a volume titled The Philosophy of Beards as well for, popular, um, uh, 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 for a popular audience. So to understand why the beard and moustache suddenly comes back into fashion in the 1850s, we have to understand how the world of gender and masculinity is changing in the period. So the, the, not the first half of the 19th century is an age of industrialization. 
and, and, and of urbanization. And this has pushed men to consider a series of important questions. Um, this was an increasingly competitive and commercial society. It was a society in which men increasingly worked outside and well beyond the home. It was a society where there were profound anxieties about women's potential economic, sexual and intellectual independence. So in this context, men needed new ways to demonstrate their authority and status and manliness. And to do so, they turned to the male body. So manliness increasingly centers on kind of physical vitality and the kind of mental strength associated with men. Um, sporting culture becomes incredibly important to the assertion of manliness. Um, but the beard also becomes another marker of the natural strength of the male body. It signifies a kind of timeless, natural manliness in an increasingly urban and industrialised world. And one example of this on the slide is Albert Smith. So Smith was a journalist who had written satirical articles for the popular magazine Punch. Um, but his real fame came when he put on a one man show at London theatres describing his climb up Mont Blanc in the Alps. Um, and mountaineering quickly became a central example of the new muscular, physical masculinity that was being embraced in the middle of the 19th century. Between 1852 and 1858, some half a million people saw Smith's one man show in which he sported a very large and highly visible beard. And he also helped find the Alpine Club, um, a mountaineering club for urban professional men. Um, and this offered one example of the increased popularity of mountaineering culture in which the beard was a central accessory. And in fact, John Ruskin, um, the Victorian art critic after whom Anglia Ruskin University Cambridge is named, was a member of the Alpine Club. So Ruskin, like Smith, sought out the opportunity to forge his manhood and his beard in the rough and ready perils of the natural world. But there are some other reasons for the Beard's Victorian Renaissance. Um, one was it made, it made men look less emotional, right? So to be a, a Victorian man was to be a stoical man. In other words, to not show your emotions. Um, and women were held to be more emotional than men. So the beard, by hiding the expressions of the face, made Victorian men seem more reasonable and rational and inexpressive and less emotional. Uh, and similar distinctions between men and women were enshrined through the beard. So supporters of beards argued that men had them because they went out to work and therefore endured the roughness of daily toil, which the beard helped protect them from. And indeed, some people argued that the beard actually protected you from things like cholera and deadly illnesses because it was a, it protected you from breathing in bad particles and, and, and miasma. Um, women were supposed to sit at home as the angels of the household, kind of practicing a kind of quiet domesticity, so they didn't need a beard, according to the Victorian reasoning. In other words, the social roles of men and women were written on the body. Um, each had a body fitted to their role in society, and so for Victorians the beard was a telling testament to the proper place of men and women in daily life. And this made Victorians even more interested in the idea of the bearded woman, right? And a standout example of, of this, this in practice was Josephine Clofulia, who's a Swiss woman who becomes a popular attraction in, in French theatres and who becomes part of P.T. Barnum's American Museum show in New York. There's an absolutely awful musical film um, about, uh, about P.T. Barnum's American Museum. Um, nobody disputed that Josephine was a woman. Um, and we might expect Victorians who are kind of heavily invested in the idea that beards were a demonstration of manliness um, to be unnerved by women like Josephine. Yet in reality, she was the exception that proved the rule. She was the, the, she reinforced the idea that normal women were not hairy and that normal men were. And in fact, the second half of the 19th century sees the real beginnings um, of um, the practice of pathologizing female body hair as unnatural. Um, hairy women are increasingly described um, as having an abnormality of the uterus, and they're increasingly offered um, electrolysis, which is basically removing hair using electricity, so a kind of er early version of some of the hair removal practices we have today. So despite the importance of hair in shoring up ideas of manliness and femininity, um, the triumph of the beard was actually relatively short-lived. Um, by the 1900s, facial hair was on the decline again. Uh, by the early 20th century, men had reverted to a more clean-shaven look, and in fact muscles had triumphed over facial hair as the chief physical attribute of manliness. 
um, the British Army finally removed the requirement for all officers to have moustaches in 1916, um, because in the trench fighting of the First World War, um, the upkeep of moustaches had become impossible and largely irrelevant to military success. So in the wake of this shift with the kind of decline of military masculinity's association with facial hair, many other men began to move towards a more clean shaven style. And so it's here that I want to kind of end our history of the beard, partly because we're not going to have tough enough time to go all the way into the 20th century. Um, but that history in the 20th century has continued to be one of rising and falling popularity. Um, the previous 120 years have seen the beard come and go, um, variously associated with the authoritarian tendencies of Stalin and Hitler, or with the kind of unkempt anti-establishment politics of John Lennon and people like Che Guevara. But I wanted to finish um, on an observation and a question. In the last few years, we've experienced a great resurgence of the beard and the moustache, and facial hair is, is everywhere. We've heard a lot in this talk about why beards have been popular at different moments in time. So I wondered what you thought about what explains the recent revival of facial hair in the last few years, why the beard and moustache have become trendy again, um, if there are any similarities or differences perhaps with the previous fashions we've seen for beards. Um, so feel free to kind of come up with some ideas that answer that question and we'll have a discussion about that. Um, but also if you've got any questions at all about this talk or um, about history at ARU or anything else, then please feel free to ask them. We've got about, I think, 15 minutes for questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Will. Um, that was really enjoyable. And I think uh, I'm now just trying to decide if I want to keep my beard or, or get rid of it. Um, but I think I'll perhaps kick us off a bit with answering one of those questions as someone that does have a beard. Um, for me, I, I tend to do it because when I shave my beard, I think I look about 10 years younger um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't like that. So I think it's that, I guess, like we spoke about or alluded to at the start, that idea of being an adult man uh, as opposed to a, a younger looking man. Um, even though, you know, my mother-in-law thinks it looks a lot better shaven. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know, for me, that's that's my main main reason, but yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because there's, there's also a kind of generational thing going on there as well, right? So um, like you're, you're, you're mother-in-law is presumably from an older generation who mm. might have kind of seen clean shavenness as mm. being, you know, the way men should be um, whereas now we don't perhaps have that same kind of view it's changed quite a lot in the, even in the last 10 years I think. I think so um, thinking about that actually in generational uh, thing one of the questions I have was about whether or not it tended to be like a family trend um, so for example if you grew up in a family where beards were prevalent, were you more likely to, or would you tend to follow the trend in society more, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting question. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about that. <laughs> um, I, I, I want, yeah, I want to see if, if anybody else has any questions um, as well as Rob, because me and Rob could have an excellent discussion um, for the next, uh, well, we could go on and on, couldn't we? Um, but um, this is so. This is an interesting question. Do you think that beards are still linked with anti-establishment views? For example, Corbyn has a beard, but Johnson, Cameron, Starmer, etc., are clear-shaven. Um, yes, absolutely. I do think there's a kind of relationship between between beards and anti-establishment views. I think that the beard has become much more associated, if not with anti-establishment politics, then kind of with the left politically. I think um, over the last, particularly over the last few years. Um, I do think that it's interesting that facial hair is also linked to class as well, right? So particularly in the early 20th century, the, the, the people that are driving the, the change towards more clean shaven faces are the upper classes who are kind of very critical of, of people who have beards and who have facial hair. Um, and it's used as a way of distinguishing them from those below them. Um, so I think there's also a kind of class thing, class thing going on here as well as a political radicalism thing um but yeah absolutely i think i think there is a tendency to link beards to a more anti-establishment mindset or indeed hairiness in general you know if you think about somebody like um russell brand who likes to position himself as a kind of a bit of a radical um in various ways you know he's got very long hair big old beard you know you might say that jesus was the original anti-establishment radical <laughs> who was of course a very bearded gentleman Yes, well, quite. I mean, 
Boris kind of is obviously completely unbearded, isn't he? But he does have very messy hair, um, you know, which for some people kind of signifies his his erratic personality and his his lack of a kind of polite kind of well mannered demeanour. But for other people, it's a kind of a marker of uh, idiosyncratic genius. Um, you know, the kind of idea of the mad scientist, I suppose, with unkempt hair. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Any other thoughts, anybody? Or questions? Well, should we come back to your question? What was your question again that you asked me before I rudely switched to? No, that's fine. Um, it was about, uh, I think I was sort of asking, did societal trends become more important than, say, family trends? So, for example, if your family was quite prevalent at having beards, you know, your father had a beard, grandfather, would you tend to follow that trend or do you think societal trends would take over? Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think a lot of people of my generation, their parents were fairly clean, mm. sorry, fairly clean shaven. So, and I, and I think one of the interesting things about the beard in the early 19th century is it's kind of, it's worn by young men as a kind of deliberate rebellion against an older right. generation, against their fathers, right? Um, so I think there's an element of kind of, there's a societal thing, a kind of, you know, broader trend towards or away from beards. But I also think it can be kind of used as a tool to separate yourself out from from uh, from your forebears, mm. uh, and that's certainly what's happening in, in the early nineteenth century. Mm. Another question as well, actually. Well, if anyone else wants to type a question, please do, and, and we'll uh, ignore mine. But um, I was just wondering if, with regards to uh, facial hair and hair in general, whether hair colour had any connotations. Um, you know, whether that was considered to be, you know, if you had a certain hair colour. I guess I'm thinking about things with you know, Nazi Germany and the Aryan race and things like that, whether that has happened a lot throughout history. That's an interesting one. It's um, the, the discussion of colour in, in facial hair is less apparent um, in the kind of racialized discourses that we see in the 19th century and the early 20th century. What tends to be talked about there is the texture of hair. So there's kind of a, there's kind of a racial stereotype that revolves around the idea that black people have kind of woollier woollier hair including beard hair for example and actually i think um if you look at the slide um with the diagram on here um it says woolly haired or tropical type for example um so that certainly factors into it the color is less important but where the color is important um is in the uptake of the cavalry moustache in the army in the, in the 19th and early 20th century because that exclusively almost is black and in fact, men dye their moustaches black um, so that they can get the right look. Um, so colour there is quite important, which is interesting because today I think there's a tendency towards the kind of fashionable kind of salt and peppery kind of beard that has kind of bits of grey hair and other colours all kind of mixed together, if you see what I mean. Um, so there's, there's certainly been changes in how the colour of facial hair has been seen, but also think things like te the texture of, of facial hair. Um, I do have another question, but I'll wait and see if anyone else does first. And I'm aware of the time as well. So. Got a question from Beth there, Well, mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So what's interesting about the changing attitudes to beards is that when beards become more fashionable, people, for, people argue for their hygienic qualities. And when they become less fashionable, they're seen as a hygienic nuisance. So the kind of whether they're fashionable or not, or not changes with the, um, uh, sorry, whether they're hygienic or not changes with whether they're fashionable or not. So um, in the 1850s, when beards are really popular, people are claiming that they have a hygienic function. They protect the skin, they protect the face. Um, even going so far as to suggest that actually the skin that's under a under a man's beard is the cleanest part of his face. Um, whereas uh, in in the eighteenth century, um, people are more worried about the idea that the beard is a kind of it's described as a kind of an excrescence, almost like a kind of um, almost like sweat, uh, 
you know, that kind of comes out of the body and so needs to be shaved off because it's kind of like waste matter. So they're more interested in that idea. Um, so there are kind of changing views on whether whether beards are, whether beards are hygienic or not. Um, but of course, nowadays we have a some of this is linked to kind of trends in consumption, right? So that's one of the reasons that shaving takes off in the 18th century is you've got suddenly shopping, consumption, um, advertising becomes a really big thing. So people want to sell razors, they want to sell shaving foam stuff. Um, so there's a market for it. And I think a similar thing today has happened with beards where, you know, we have a whole kind of market for stuff that's aimed at cleaning your beard and keeping it hygienic. So some of those ideas about hygiene, I think, are often linked to kind of consumer changes in marketing as well. Thank you, that's all right. Any more questions? We've got a few more minutes. So if anybody has any others. That's a really interesting question, yes. Um, I think what the past certainly shows us is that beards have a long um, running association with marking people as different, marking people as other, um, marking them in a negative light. Um, and, and they've continued to fulfill that function today. Um, I mean, that's certainly apparent um, you know, in in uh, in Germany, um, in you know, in the 1930s and 40s, for example, um, attitudes towards um, uh, uh, Jewish um, use of the beard and the Aryan the Aryan body was a very kind of, you know, a, sh a clean shaven body. Um, it was a muscly body rather than a hairy body, um, and so I think you know, again, um, often um, in kind of more right wing. Um, Islamophobic discourse, we kind of see the same attitudes to to beards come up. It's also really interesting that that, that discrimination is also present in very subtle and different and interesting ways um, in shaving products as well. So, for example, um, uh, razors like Gillette razors are basically designed for um, they're designed for uh, they're designed around the white man, right? Um, and it means that um, using often um, studies have shown um, that uh, African American men, for example, using Gillette white razors are more likely to have um, ingrown hairs and stuff and cuts and things um, because um, the hair follicles are different, for example. So it's interesting that kind of discrimination has also been built into shaving products as well, um, sadly. Um, that's a slightly rambling answer. But I think, yes, I think the point is, is that anything about the body historically can and has been used to discriminate between people and differentiate between people, whether that's beards or skin colour or, you know, the size of one's, you know, the, the racial stereotype, racial stereotypes that are focused on facial features, noses, eyes, lips, those kinds of things. All of those things have historically been used to, to distinguish between people. Um, okay. Still used today as well. Sadly, there's been a kind of resurgence in kind of pseudo racial pseudoscience. Um, sadly, which lots of people are kind of trying to to combat. Um, we thought it had kind of died a death, but sadly, there are still people who believe in the idea of kind of innate biological racial difference and inferiority, which is very sad to see. Um, Perfect. Um, I think we will probably stop there will um i don't think we've got any more questions coming in i'm sure we're at the time as well um about a minute to go so i think that's that's pretty well timed um so i just want to say thank you very much uh, for running that session uh, as a, a bearded man i found it very interesting i'm sure as well as a uh, non-bearded men uh, or women <laughs> it was also very interesting so thank you very much thank you to those that have attended um like i said at the start if you'd like to attend any attend any of the other sessions we've got this week please do. Uh, you'll be able to sign up to them in our Eventbrite. Um, but other than that, thank you very much. Um, and we will see you all soon, hopefully. Thanks very much, guys.